they saw that the child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasure of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. This is the word of the Lord. All right, please be seated. By way of introduction, we've just been kind of comprehensively adding, as we work through the 11th chapter of Hebrews, adding more characters and more actions to this working definition of, you know, and the corresponding examples of what it is to do something in faith. If we were to simply describe what is faith, to answer that question, just define faith, there would be probably a different definition. So the disclaimer is this. Uh, the definition that I've provided is, is more particularly having to do with uh, what is it to do something in faith or to live by faith. So, so think of that prepositional phrase right, right in front of, or preposition, right in front of the word faith, in faith or by faith, to live by faith, to die in faith. Uh, to build in faith, to obey in faith, these kinds of things. So we're not merely defining faith, um, but we're defining what it is to live and to act, to speak, um, to die even in faith. And this is the definition that I've provided each week as we've worked through the 11th chapter of Hebrews. To live by faith or to do anything by faith is to be governed by a dependence on God's grace and a desire for God's glory depending on God's grace, desiring his glory. Unbelievers, because of common grace and the Imago Dei, it's a twofold argument, common grace and the Imago Dei. Common grace meaning, um, as Ecclesiastes says, he causes it to reign on both the wicked and the righteous. Uh, that God is slow to anger, abounding in love. He is long-suffering. He is patient. The scripture does not say that God is um, rash in his anger, and the scripture does not say that God has no anger. Uh, what the scripture teaches, rather, is that because God is holy, God is angry. Because he's holy, he's angry. The person who's angry about nothing is the person who loves nothing. So God is angry because God is a loving God. God is love. Because he's loving, he has wrath. Now, we want to say God is wrath in terms of the perfections of God or attributes of God. God is love. Uh, God also, we could say, God is justice. God is just. God is holy. God is righteous. Um, we could say all these things, but wrath would really be the effect of the character and nature of God, and who he is. Because God is love and just and righteous and holy, um, all these different things, all of God's attributes, because God is God, all that is in God is God. Because God is who he is, he hates all that which contradicts his character, all that which opposes him, all that which rebels against him. Because God is good and perfect and holy and right, he hates sin. He hates sin. And he is angry towards sin. And if we're going to be biblically precise, God is angry not only towards sin, but towards sinners. The Bible is very clear about that. Multiple times in the Psalms, the scripture says that, that God has anger and wrath towards not just sin, but sinners. It's important that we remember that in hell for eternity, we will not have the ethereal, abstract spirits of lust, the spirit of murder being punished by God forever in hell. It will be perverts and murderers. It will not be theft punished for eternity in hell. It will be thieves. God is going to punish people. God currently is punishing people. There are people in hell right now. And there are consequences and judgments that God pours out in punishment for sin upon the heads of sinners, even in this life. And the Bible is filled with those examples. Cities like Sodom. God poured out his judgment here on earth. But, all that being said, God is an angry God because he is a holy God. 
but he is slow in his anger. So, so God is not God because he's without anger. And God as God is not rash in his anger. But he is angry for the right things at the right time in the right measure. God has perfect holy anger. Anger for the right things at the right time in the right measure. And God is slow and patient in his anger. So all that being said, you can be an unbeliever who God is angry towards. You're at enmity with God, right? Romans chapter 8, the mind of the sinful man, it's not merely indifferent or uninterested, but it is hostile towards God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it. So the mind of the sinful man is unwilling and unable to submit to the law of God, to submit to God, and and therefore is not neutral towards God, but hostile towards God, at enmity with God. And it is rightly said in Scripture that God has anger towards this individual. That it's not just that the person, the unbelieving person, sees God as their enemy, but that God also sees that person as his enemy. The beauty is that Jesus died for his enemies. And the beauty is that while we were at our worst state, right, at the worst state possible, Christ died for us. Very rarely would anyone die for a perfect man, a righteous man, though for a good man, one might possibly dare to die. But God shows his love, demonstrates his love for us in this, uh, that while we were yet sinners and at enmity with God, Christ died for us. So God has enemies, absolutely. But in his common grace... He is merciful and kind towards his enemies. Uh, Enemies of God still have food to eat. Enemies of God still have breath in their lungs. Enemies of God still get to enjoy the benefits of marriage and family and children. Enemies of God, for the enemy of God who God chooses not to save, earth is the closest taste of heaven they'll ever have. And for the Christian, those who are children of God, by grace alone, through faith in Christ alone, earth is the closest to hell we'll ever experience. So God has common grace. Also, the doctrine of imago Dei, that people are made in the image of God. Uh, what, What a progressive will tell you, what an atheist, an unbeliever, agnostic, and just a secularist, your modern person who's not a Christian, what they'll tell you is that that man, two layers of man, the outward and the inward. On the outside, the external portion of man, if you will, they'll say is a parasite, a leech, a consumer, a burden. Right? That the world would be better off with fewer people because people are merely um, liabilities, just more mouths to feed. And so the unbelieving view of man, anthropology, is that on the outside, he's a consumer, On the outside, he's a leech. But on the inside, um, he has a heart as pure as the driven snow. That's the unbelieving view of man. Outside, bad. Inside, good. Outside, parasite. If we could exterminate a few of them, get away with it, it'd be great. We already are. So outside, man is bad. But inside, just follow your heart. Because you're a really good person. You're innately good. The biblical view of man is precisely the opposite. On the outside, because the Imago Dei and common grace, these two doctrines working in tandem, an unbelieving person at enmity with God, who hates God, um, can do wonderful things. It's not just, oh, here's another mouth to feed, but this is somebody who can develop certain kinds of innovation to feed their own mouth and the mouths of 500,000 other mouths as well. So on the outside, because people are made in the image of God and because of God's common grace, causing it to rain, giving his resources and his loving gifts, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights because he gives these to all, Christians and non-Christians alike, because of God's common grace and the Imago Dei, that people, all people, not just Christian people, but all people are made in the image of God, and through sin that image has been tarnished, but a vestige of the image of God still remains intact because of these two things, common grace and the image of God in man. On the outside, man can do incredibly wonderful things. And on the inside, the heart of man is desperately sick. The heart of man is filled with malice, deceit. 
that in the heart of man, he's at enmity with God. He is totally depraved, which is distinct from the doctrine of utter depravity. Utter depravity would be the idea that a person who's utterly depraved was doing as much evil as they possibly could at every possible moment. Uh, the Bible does not affirm the doctrine of utter depravity. But total depravity means that man can be doing things on the outside, externally, outward deeds and actions and even speech and words that outwardly align with the moral will of God, but inwardly totally depraved, the sin nature, meaning that they're never doing it, back to the definition, they're never doing it with, with a dependence on God's grace and a desire for God's glory. That's the difference. Romans 14 says, anything that does not proceed from faith is sin. Hebrews goes on to say, as we'll see, that without faith it is impossible to please God. So we're not saying that unbelievers are distinct from Christians because they never do anything good. That's not a biblical doctrine. What we're saying is that unbelievers, when they do good things, which they can and they have and they will continue because of common grace and the Imago Dei, when unbelievers do outwardly things that align with the moral will of God, they do it still in hatred of God. With no recognition of the grace of God and no desire for the glory of God. They do it with a dependence on their own strength or perhaps the collective strength of humanity and a desire for their own glory or perhaps the glory of humanity. One small step for man, one giant leap for God, mankind. Um, and so the point is simply to say that to do something in faith doesn't mean merely to do something good or moral. Unbelievers can do things that are outwardly moral. But to do something in faith is to do it something that not just on the outward appearance aligns with the moral will of God, but inwardly the heart of that individual is relying on God's grace and desiring God's glory. That the person is doing it in faith, a loving faith in Christ. So that's our working definition. And what we see throughout the entirety of the chap uh, 11th chapter of Hebrews is just multiple examples from the Old Testament of individuals who did things in faith. What we've seen is that Abraham obeyed by faith. Or I'm sorry, Noah built by faith. That was verse 7. Abraham obeyed by faith. That was verse 8. Abraham's faith was tested. That was verse 17. The patriarchs being, in this case, Noah would be wrapped in, but Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they died in faith. That was verse 13. And then Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, they blessed their sons and in a sense, they prophesied what would come to pass by faith. And then what we're seeing today in verse 23 through 28, we see that Moses was preserved by faith. Uh, and then by faith, he rejected worldliness. And then he chose to flee Egypt by faith. And he was saved by, a, um, uh, by atoning blood by faith. By trusting in that sacrifice, trusting in the blood. So what we see in verses 23 through 28 of our text today is four major things. Uh, Moses was preserved by faith. He rejected worldliness by faith. He chose to flee Egypt by faith. And he was saved by atoning blood by faith. By faith. Now, because there are four things, um, four elements of, of faith in our text today, uh, we're probably going to turn this into a two-part sermon. And that's not just because I'm not feeling well. Um, that was kind of my plan this week all along. Uh, but we'll see how much we can get through. So let's go ahead and begin with the first verse, Hebrews 11:23. 23. It says this, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw that the child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now, this is John Gill's commentary on this first verse of our text. He says, Parents ought to take care of their children, and persons may lawfully hide themselves or others from the cruelty of tyrants, and that as long as they can for their safety. And this was so far from being wrong in the parents of Moses that it is commended as an instance of faith. They believe the promise in general that God would deliver the people of Israel. 
They believed this to be about the time of their deliverance, and they had some intimation that this child in particular would be the deliverer. That's John Gill's commentary. There are many others that agree with him, but essentially, um, according to that exegesis of verse 23, uh, what we would what we would see is that Moses' parents, um, it wasn't just we have a child and we love him and we don't want him to die. And just for the record, that would be sufficient. That would be sufficient justification for denying the king's edict because the king's edict, in this case, to kill all the Hebrew boys below a certain age was a wicked command. It was a wicked law. And a wicked law is no law at all. Laws must be just. All human authority is vested authority. There is no such thing as inherent human authority. No human being in whatever position of authority they might find themselves in, whether it be a father or a mother, whether it be a teacher, whether it be a governor or a president, uh, regardless of what it may be, what it, whether it be a pastor or a deacon, ecclesiastical authority, whatever kind of authority a person has, it is never inherent. It is never rooted in the person themselves. It is always an authority that is vested to that person with specific rights corresponding with specific responsibilities and given for a time as God sees fit to accomplish God's purposes in the world. And that's the same with the civil magistrate. It's the same with civil authority. The king or whatever whatever government you may have with civil magistrates, they don't have inherent authority. They have vested authority to do what God commands. And when they step outside of those boundaries, then it's not not that, oh, we don't need to submit to that law. The, The best way to think about it is, oh, that's not a law. A wicked law is not a law. Because people don't have authority in and of themselves. Period. So if it's a wicked law, it's not a law. Now that said, that doesn't mean that we should rebel against every wicked law. It means that we can, we may rebel against every wicked law. But I think that Christians need to be wise. Innocent as doves, but as shrewd as serpents. Jesus indicts the children of God, children of the light, by saying that that the world, the children of darkness, are more shrewd than the children of light. And what Jesus is saying is he's saying that Christians could afford to be more shrewd, not deceitful, but shrewd, strategic, cunning, wise, innocent as a dove, but shrewd as serpents. So for instance, I believe that any taxation that rivals the tithe is unjust. So if any government including our own, um, exacts a tax upon its citizens of 10% or more, then that is an unjust law. Therefore, I believe biblically it is permissible to not obey that unjust law because an unjust law is no law at all. However, I don't think that it would be shrewd for us to all have prison ministries because you will go to jail. You're not going to win that battle. I think there are other battles, other hills that we should die on. There are plenty of unjust laws. Seems to be um, no scarcity, especially these days. So I think that there are other ones that are perhaps more strategic where we have, we want to take a hill that's significant, but a hill that's also winnable. We don't want to just be kamikaze you know, pilots. We don't want to just go on suicide missions. Now, there are some things, I mean, martyrdom is a real category within the Christian faith. There are some things where we just simply can't compromise. We can't. We can't deny Christ, right? So there are some things where it is a suicide mission. Faithfulness to God will end um, in our own deaths. But there is a way to, although it's permissible, to say, I'm not going to pay 30% taxes to Caesar, right? We'll render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Yeah, but who gets to decide who's, what, what belongs to Caesar? See, that's what weak, spineless, cowardly, pushover, beta Christians always say, right? We'll render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And what they immediately are exegeting, no, eisegeting into the text is, is they're assuming Caesar gets to decide what's Caesar's. 
When Jesus says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's, the assumption, the necessary inference from that text is that God gets to decide what is God's and what is Caesar's. Caesar doesn't just get to make up a number in his head and say, this is Caesar's. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus isn't saying, render unto Caesar and, let, and, and, and Caesar can make up anything he wants and you have to do it. How do we know Jesus isn't saying that? Because there are other biblical commands. Like feeding your children. What if Caesar decides 100%? Well, Jesus said, render unto Caesar. Sorry, kids, we're not eating anymore. Would Jesus support that? Of course not. So think. Think. And really, it's not an intellectual, it's not like it's hard exegesis. Um, the render unto Caesar, whatever Caesar says, is not... Um, I can't exegete scripture position. It's um, I'm a coward and don't want to get involved in the culture, Christian. That's what it is. We all know that. So don't be like that. But the point is, that's not necessarily the battle that we should fight. Because although it's permissible not to render 30% of your income to Caesar, it's also permissible that you could. You could. We also have a biblical theology that allows for us to be wronged to a certain degree. Now, not to the degree where now others that we are responsible for, our dependents, are now suffering immensely. Not to the degree where we're neglecting other God-given responsibilities, but we can allow ourselves to be wronged to a certain degree. So it's permissible to say, this is an unjust law, I'm not going to obey it. It's also permissible to say, this is an unjust law, but it does not cause me to deny Christ. It simply impedes my creature comforts and conveniences and these kinds of things, and so I'm going to abide. And I'm going to abide knowing that it's unjust, saying publicly that it's unjust, but I'm going to abide because this hill, although it would be significant if we could take it, it is not a winnable hill. And there are other hills that are maybe not quite as significant, some of them perhaps even more, but they're also more winnable. And I want to give my life to the hills that can be won. So that's kind of the framework for thinking of where do we stand? Where do we fight? What do we resist? And if it's unjust, then why do we do it? Uh, that's how we would flesh that out. So all that being said, Moses' parents resist an edict from the civil magistrate. Moses was supposed to die. He's a Hebrew boy. Under a certain age, he was supposed to die. And Moses' parents hide him. This brings into question, so everything that I've been talking about so far is, you know, the phrase for this or the label would be the lie of necessity. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the lie of necessity or have done any study on that particular doctrine. The lie of necessity would be, well, this would be an example, Moses' parents hiding him away. Um, another example would be, you know, Joseph, in the case of Jesus, uh, they flee to Egypt um, to hide from uh, King Herod who wants to do the same thing that Pharaoh did and kill uh, boys in Bethlehem below a certain age. Um, another example would be Rahab, who lies um, about the spies of Israel, and that she's actually harboring the spies. And they specifically ask, you know, where do they go? And she says, if you go quickly, you can catch up to them. They, they ran this way. Um, and so she actually, uh, it's not just a um, silence, but it's that she actually says a, a falsehood. She actually deliberately says a falsehood, and she's considered someone of faith. Um, another example would be, let's see, uh, you've got Rahab. Oh, well, the, you know, the, um, the midwives in Egypt uh, that we find in uh, Exodus chapter 1 and 2. Um, it says the midwives, they feared God. Right? So they wouldn't actually do what Pharaoh commanded them to do. Pharaoh commanded them to show up and that they were supposed to put to death any of the children if it was a boy. And they actually, again, they, they don't just, it's not just, um, uh, you know, just assumed deceit from an argument of silence, but they actually, they actually vocally present falsehood to Pharaoh. They tell Pharaoh that, you know, the Hebrew women are strong. They're strong women. And when we show up um, for their birth, they've already, they've already given birth before we can get there. Um, but the Bible says that they feared God. These midwives feared God. And, and therefore, they, it's not that they didn't fear Pharaoh, but they just feared God more. 
By the way, if you're wondering, where does courage come from? Uh, courage comes from the fear of the Lord. I'll say that again. If you're wondering, how come some people seem more courageous than others? How come some churches will take a stand and others won't? How come some pastors, you know, they'd they be, be willing to talk about this and other pastors won't? How come? That? It's very simple. Courage comes from the fear of the Lord. Courage is, is your willingness to not fear man. And the antidote to the fear of man is a greater fear. How do you, how do you stop fearing man? Well, we think of it as like, well, I fear man this much, so I need to muster up this much courage. So I, I need this much courage to overcome fear. That's actually not how you, how you get victory in this area. Um, you don't need more courage to overcome fear. You need a greater fear to overcome fear. A greater fear. Right? I mean, think about like as an illustration. There are, you know, cases where someone, you know, like, I don't know. You're, you're, you're living in a house and it's under, you know, it's surrounded by enemy. You know, you're in a town that's been taken over by enemies and all these kinds of things. And, and you're beginning to waste away. You're running out of supplies. You know, you've got to provide for your children. And you don't want to go outside because other neighbors have gone outside and they've been shot. You know, they've been killed. It's very, very dangerous. You've been commanded that you have to stay in your home. Um, and so you don't want to go outside. You're afraid. You're afraid that you might lose your life. You're in a hostile territory that's been overtaken by some kind of foreign enemy. All right? So there's a fear of going outside. But your children then begin to waste away, right? Because a week goes by, and then two, and then three. You've ran out of supplies. It's been three days since anyone's eaten. You're, you're on your last bottle of water. Um, and all of a sudden, you have a greater fear your children dying in the house becomes a greater fear than you being shot in the street. A child dying of thirst and hunger in the house, greater fear than you being shot in the face in the street. And so what do you do? You go out in the street. Why? Because you're just this courageous guy who has no fear? No, because you have a greater fear that drives you to face the lesser fear. And so it is with the fear of the Lord. Jesus says, do not fear those who can kill the body, but after having killed the body, can do no more harm to you, but rather rest in the fact that God loves you. No, that's not what Jesus says. Rather, how, how do you be bold as a lion? How are the righteous as bold as lions and they don't fear man who really can kill you? It's not like man, Jesus doesn't say, don't fear man, he can't do anything to you. No, he said, don't fear man because all he can do to you is rip you apart and end your life. It's not like he can't do anything. He can do a, a, a decent amount. But then Jesus, what, the way that he, he handles that is he doesn't say, don't fear man because he can't do anything. And he also doesn't say, don't fear man because God's really loving. He says, don't fear man who can do a lot. You should rather fear God who after destroying the body can throw your soul into hell. That's Jesus' argument for courage. That's how Jesus inspires courage. And at the end of the day, the people who don't stand up, the people who aren't particularly courageous, I, the, the common denominator, it's simple. It could, you know, it could be a guy with Reformed theology, Arminian theology. It's all across the board, denominationally, doctrinally. But it all comes down to one issue, one issue. People who don't have courage are people who don't fear the Lord. That's all it is. They fear man more than God. They care more about getting a good review from the New York Times on their latest book then they care about having their name written in the book of life. And Timothy Keller would be an example. And there are many more. At the end of the day, that's, that's all it boils down to. Somewhere along the way, David French, whoever, I mean, fill in the blank. But eventually, somewhere along the way, these guys care more about human accolades and the praise of men than they care about the praise that comes from God. And they also, they fear more the loss of the praise of men. The fear of man is more consuming. It is a greater fear than their fear of God. So all that being said, the lie of necessity, I mean, you've got Rahab, you've got the, um, the Hebrew midwives. In Egypt, you've got, um, you've got, well, Moses' parents hiding him away. You've got Joseph fleeing to Egypt. Um, in, in this doctrine, so to give an example, um, so is it ethical, right? Can, can a Christian do this with a clear conscience before the Lord? Um, can a Christian serve in the military? And, and let's think about the military before it just became the, the gay pride, you know, global police, you know, but like 
I, I hate to say that, I'm grateful for our military, but I'm not super interested in making sure that Ukraine has a trans flag. So there's my politics, all right? So there you go. If anybody was wondering, is he a conservative? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I'm not interested in the homo jihad. Um, not, I don't, I don't want to do that. I want, I want the military to do what it's supposed to do. And service members in the military, for the record, it's not their fault. It's the people above them that have lost their minds. And that's why we need to call them to accountability. But all that being said, let's say the military is fighting a just war. Not just for trans rights, but a just war. Okay? Can they wear camouflage? Because camouflage, literally, what, what it does is it tells someone, I'm not here when you are. You're lying. Right? And it's one thing to lie to deer. You know, you lie to deer, you know, all year long, not just in, on your hunting trip, right? I know what you do. You feed that deer. It's, it becomes your pet. It's basically eating out of your hand for like a year, you know? It has a name, you know, all these different things. Your kids ride on it, you know, certain days out of the month. And then one day, you, you know, you stand out there, you know, and you've got a revolver in your hand and you got some feed in the other and you shoot it in the head and you call it hunting. Okay, but apart from that, right, that's lying to a deer, okay? But in terms of lying to people, right, like you're in war and, and you're disguising yourself. I mean, what is a submarine? Why submarines? Why not just boats? It's deception. So the question is, is there any degree or measure of deception that is biblically ethical, permissible? And I believe that there is such a thing as the lie of necessity, that there actually is such a doctrine that allows not only for something to be permissible, but as we see in our text today, that there are certain lies uh, that are actually commended by God. Moses' parents hid him away. And they make it into the hall of fame or the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And this is a commendation. This is something they did that I believe is clear from scripture. It pleased the Lord. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Let me give one more practical example, okay? Just bring it home, make it, make it something that we're all, it's like, oh, yeah. Like, what about a vaccine card? Uh, a fake vaccine passport, right? You know, it's like, I got a good guy. I got a good uh, vaccine passport guy. Um, wh what about that? Uh, is that ethical? Um, could you go and get a fake vaccine passport? Let's say, for instance, you live in Canada, right? We have a few families in our church who have lived in Canada, and they flee from Canada. Um, could you, for instance, get a fake vaccine passport in order to cross the border? Uh, would, that, would that be a kind of deception or a kind of lie that would be, in the sight of God, um, objectively sinful? Or would there be an allowance for such a thing? Would there be a biblical argument that God would say, uh, given the situation in this time, with all the, you know, the multivariant factors at play, um, this is something that is ethically permissible. Um, I personally would say that it is, at this time, permissible. Because again, you have conflicting commandments from God. You have conflicting commandments from God. And what I mean is, um, if you're a father or a mother and you have children, now I don't know all the laws, okay? So just some of this is hypothetical and some of it may be actual, but... I haven't kept up to with every single dotted I and cross T. But the point is, let's just say that your children have to be vaccinated to cross the border. Is that, is that a thing? Not yet? Okay. Let's say it was, though. Okay. So your children have to be vaccinated. So this is hypothetical. To cross the border. Um, young children. With a vaccine that has not been tested in terms of its you know, long-term effects. It's like, what do you mean it hasn't been tested? We have a huge sample size, the entire population of the world. Okay, yeah, but, but for like what, like 18 months, right? And so, so as a father and a mother, right, that's, there's three sovereign spheres, the home, the church, and the state. 
Um, each of these spheres has authority, fathers and mothers. You know, in the church, we have pastors and deacons. In the state, we have the civil magistrate, governors and mayors and presidents and congress. And, uh, but, but in each of these three spheres, each of these authority figures have been given certain rights and certain responsibilities. Uh, physical welfare has not been given to the state. And to be fair, physical welfare has not been given to the church either. People always make that argument. You know, well, yeah, the state, you know, shouldn't be doing welfare. That's the church's job. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's your job. Fathers, if a man does not provide for the members of his own household and even his extended family, he is worse than an unbeliever and has denied the faith. That's what the Bible teaches. And if a man is not willing to work, the church's ministry to him is that they let him not eat. Right? So the church can meet physical needs, physical welfare, but the church is not the first line of defense or the first source of provision for physical welfare. God has designed the family to be that. The fathers would provide. And when fathers fail, and not just because of laziness, but, but when a father dies and there's actually orphans and widows, 1 Timothy chapter 5 talks about the poor who should receive physical service and help from the church. But the poor that receive help from the church, number one, they're, they're the, the helpless poor. They're the helpless poor, meaning that there's nothing that they can do. It's not just an unwillingness to work. It's not just this or that. It's, it's that they, um, they're a widow. They're an orphan. And there are certain requirements that have to be met, right? It's not just a, a phone call and then all of a sudden you get a check for $600 a month. Um, no, you, you actually have to be over a certain age, 65. Um, you actually have to have no sons and other family members that can meet that need. If there are other family members, extended family members, an uncle, a son, a brother, that can meet the need, it should fall on them. If all those, that's the practical criteria, is met, then there's the spiritual criteria. Is she faithful? Has she washed the feet of the saints? It's like, has she raised up children? And these are the kinds of things that are looked at, which, which means, and it's like, well, oh, man, that doesn't sound compassionate. No, no, God is just. You don't get to be a 70-year-old, purple-haired feminist that refused to have kids and all of a sudden has a disability and can't provide for yourself and get the church that you spent 70 years hating their cash. No. No. You don't get that. Well, why, why, don't, why don't we do nice things to, to people who hate God? Well, because Christ is infinite, but the church is finite. Christ's body, which is the church in the world, is not infinite. It is finite, with finite resources. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, as often as you have opportunity, do good to all, but especially the household of faith. In other words, as often as you have opportunity, give free lunch to everybody. Well, it doesn't even say that. It says good, and free lunch actually wouldn't be morally good. But do morally good things, which have physical implications, welfare would be included, to all, but prioritize the household of faith prioritize a household of faith. Now, here's the deal. The church is finite. It's finite in its resources. And therefore, when the church has a choice between helping the person who spent their life hating God and helping the person who spent their life serving God, who does the church pick? Right? It's a simple question, but here's the deal. A lot of evangelicals get this wrong. They literally think, and, and this is their, their reasoning, they think in the name of evangelism, in the name of evangelism, what we're going to do is exasperate the members of the church with constant volunteering and service and giving and tithing. Right? Those of you who have been here for a year and a half since the beginning, how many times have I talked about tithing? Not once. There's no plate. There's not even a bucket. You couldn't give if you wanted to. It's foolish, honestly. It's really like it's to the point where it's kind of dumb. Like other pastors are like, what are you doing, dude? Um, and I'll probably preach on it eventually because it's in the Bible. And the reason I'm going to preach on it isn't just because the church needs money, uh, but because your soul needs to not go to hell. And Jesus talked about nothing more than money except for hell <laughs> and says it's very hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, which means rich men usually go to hell. So because I love you, I probably will talk about money eventually when we get to it in a text. And chances are we'll probably all have to varying degrees some kind of greed that we need to repent of. 
But for today, and for the last 18 months, apparently, I don't know how this happened, but it kind of got away from me, but I, I don't, I'm not talking about giving. But what most churches do is they, they burden the members with giving and serving and this and that, which all these things are good. It helps members to serve. It helps people to give. These are good things. But you can do it in a way that's, that's exasperating. It's, it's a way that's overbearing. But, but then they use all the money and all the service and all these things that come from the faithful to do all these, you know, kind of wide outreaches to the city with the faithless. And basically what's communicated is this. Um, if you are an outsider and an unbeliever, which biblically defined would be someone who hates God. So if you live in this city and you hate God, great. And if you hate God, but you have a decent, you know, kind of, acquaintance relationship with our church and and you hang out right here so this is the church this is where you don't want to be because you're going to have to you're going to have to do stuff right but if you hang out right here around the church and you hate god but you like us right that's you got to get the formula exactly right you got to hate god but like us and don't join us because then we'll start using you stay apart from us but orbiting around us you, you're in the sweet spot. You're going to get a lot of Chili's gift cards, free car washes, you know, this and that and all, you know. Whereas the book of Acts says that, that the Christians shared everything in common to the point where it says there was not one needy person among them. Among who? They eradicated poverty in the city of Jerusalem. No. They eradicated poverty in the church in the church of Jerusalem. And Jesus said, the poor you will always have among you. You know why we'll always have the poor among us until Jesus returns? Because we'll always have sin until Jesus returns. And poverty is linked to sin. And that doesn't mean that it's always the individual who is poor, directly their sin. I'm not saying that. Right? There's a little place, if you haven't heard of it, it's called North Korea. Right? But here's the deal. You can be poor because of your own sin, or you can be poor because of the sin of someone else oppressing you. But all poverty is always rooted in sin. Poverty is simply the lack of provision. And God did not create this world in such a way that people obeying him and being fruitful and multiplying would lead to their own lack. That's not the way that God operates. He's not cruel. God did not give humanity, the very commandment that would lend towards our demise. He doesn't say, be fruitful, multiply, wah, ha, 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 and when they do, boy, are they in for a rude awakening. Once they hit eight billion people, once they've obeyed my command enough, they'll all starve. That's not who God is. It's not how he made the world. That's not the way economies work. It's not the way wealth works. Christians say we, we need lessons on wealth. We don't understand. We think that it's a zero-sum game. Right? So if you have a bigger slice of the pie, then somebody else has a smaller one. But God created a pie that grows. Wealth can actually be multiplied. Now, God is capital C creator. He alone creates ex nihilo, out of nothing. But he's created us in his image, and even though sin has entered the world, a vestige of the image of God remains both for the believer and the unbeliever to the point that we can create. Now, we are lowercase c creators. No one creates out of nothing but God himself. But we are able, in a lowercase c fashion, to take the resources that God has baked into this world and use them to multiply provision. That's common grace. That's the Imago Dei. That's anthropology. That's just a doctrine of man. So that we don't look at 63 million children murdered over the last 49 years in their mother's wombs and think, phew, 63 million less mouths to feed. What a relief. No, we think 63 million less farmers, scientists, innovation. All the, you see what I'm saying? How do you view man? Well, the Bible says on the outside, outwardly, man is awesome because he's made in the image of God. But inwardly, he hates God. So he needs to be born again. He needs the gospel. He needs Jesus Christ. And when it comes to evangelism, one of the things I think we can do as evangelists is first and foremost, preach the gospel. But in terms of living out the implications of the gospel, the fruit of the gospel, is the way we treat our own. When the church takes care of itself, it's attractive. 
When the church takes care of one another, it's attractive. Most people today, our society is so broken down, we've despised marriage, we've despised family, despised children, despised all of our old traditional institutions. Everything has been despised, and in that, uh, everything has been broken down to where people are isolated. People are, are completely alone, and when they see there's a community that doesn't just talk, but actually lives out their faith and it's a community of love and a community of courage and a community that's a, it has a resilience baked into its framework. It's able to resist the tides and, and, and the, the, the whims of the culture or, or, the, or the current demands of, of the government. Uh, when people see a community like that and they see that it's resilient and they see that it's warm, when everything else is isolated and individualistic and cold, that's actually evangelistic. One of the best evangelistic tactics that you can use is stop giving stuff to unbelievers and let them know you're welcome. You're welcome to share in this loving community. But there's one door, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to be on the inside. You have to be a brother in Christ. And will that produce false converts? You betcha. And we'll sort it out when we get there. But all that being said, yeah, the lie of necessity. The vaccine, you know, fake vaccine, passport, or whatever it is. The point is there are conflicting commands. God has given, that's how it got onto it, the three spheres, family, church, and state. Different responsibilities to each one. Welfare belongs to the family. Right? It doesn't belong to the state, and it doesn't primarily belong to the church. The church would be like the free safety if the line of the family is crossed. Does that make sense? And I know very little football. So if that makes sense to me, it should make sense to you, um, right? So if the line is actually crossed, if it's penetrated and somebody runs through, you got the free safety of the church. But the line is fathers, familial fathers. That's the primary source for physical welfare, for physical welfare. And so, all that being said, well, one of the commandments that's given to fathers is to feed your kids, care for your kids, not inject your kids with poison. You know, lots of, you know, you know basic kind of commands. Now, I'm not saying that the vaccine is poison. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. I would just like to see, like, for more than 18 months, especially with the new technology. So, I would like to see. And the point is that a father could have this, in his conscience, this conviction. He could say, okay, here's the deal. Um, my responsibility, I cannot give my children this vaccine. Um, but they're going to be mandated if we stay in this place. And we're going to have to get out of this place. But to get out of this place, we're going to have to say that they got this thing that they haven't gotten. We're going to have to wear camouflage. Now, are we going to be judged by God? Like in the, in, the, in the eyes of God, is that crossing an ethical, moral line of deceit in the realm of lying that is objectively a sin in God's sight? Or is this permissible because of this other commandment that God is giving me? And the way that my point is, it's, it's not easy. It's not an easy doctrine. The lie of necessity, how far does it go? Where does it end? What kinds of lies? Outspoken, objective falsehoods versus simply leaving out parts of the truth. That's a lot more easy to defend where you say something true, but intentionally leave out this other part. And again, it's not just because you want to get your way, but it's the, in the preservation of others, saving others, caring for others. Notice all the examples that I gave, whether it be Rahab, whether it be the, the Hebrew midwives, whether it be Moses' parents, whether it be uh, Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, and his mother, Mary. In all these cases, it was to save someone's life. It was to save someone's life. And that's why I, you know, I believe in just war theory. Pacifism doesn't work. Pacifism is somebody who doesn't know how to read the Bible and just... I don't, I don't, I, if they're just ignorant or they haven't lived in this world long enough or what, but pacifism is, is just not a thing. It's just not a thing. Pacifism, it is a thing. It's the luxury of men who have bled out and died. That's what pacifism is. It's, it's just, it's the, the entitled theological luxury um, that rides off, you know, the back of the liberty that's been purchased by actual men. So um, don't be a pacifist. All right, so just war theory is a thing. Seven different marks of what makes a, a war just and all, the, all these different things that we can talk about another time. John Stott, uh, he was a pacifist and then he grew up and, and then he, you know, he wrote, you know, set the, you know, outlined some of these different marks of a just war. If it's a just war, right? If it's actually a just war, 
Um, yeah, what, what tactics, all right? So that's, that's determining if the war should even be fought. But then what methods are in the war? We have certain things. There, you know, there are certain measures of fighting that we've said, this, you can't do this. You cannot do this. It is unethical, right? And then other things that we've said are ethical. So my point is there's a, a large doctrine here of the lie of necessity and what you can do and what you can't. But what we can tell from the text, it seems, is that Moses' parents hid their kid and they're commended for it. Right? If Pharaoh came a knocking, they said, no baby here. And God says, well done. And the only reason I go to such great lengths with all this kind of stuff is because I, I think that we're living in a similar time. The, the, the times in, in periods of history and places, times and places, where we're thinking about the lie of necessity becomes more pertinent, more relevant, are times of tyranny. I'll say that again. Christians thinking shrewdly becomes more important in times of tyranny. Every example that you find, Moses' parents, all the examples I've already listed, they're all examples that only had to happen because people's lives were threatened by tyrants. So, so as tyranny notches up, Christians got to buckle down. And we got to buckle down with shrewdness, strategy. We got to think about which hills are permissible to defend and then which ones are actually profitable to defend. What methods are at our disposal that are ethical, but thinking in the terms of innocence? Yes, preserve the innocence of the conscience and uphold the law of God, but also not just innocent as a dove, but shrewd, cunning as a serpent. Moses' parents were cunning, and because they were cunning, Israel was saved. Israel was saved. If Moses' parents had, had the intellectual naivety of a pacifist, Moses would have died. Just say that. And God would have provided deliverance through another source. God would have gotten it done one way or another. But shrewdness is commendable. But there's a fine line between shrewdness and just plain deceit. And it's hard. It's hard to discern. So, Moses' parents, why do they do this? One level, because it's their kid, and they should do it. Parents should be willing to die for children. Not the entire adult population saying children can die for us, which is what, if you're wondering, that's what we've been doing for three years. So we have said, as, as a society, children can suffer for adults, right? Shut down their schools. Yeah, you know, two-year-olds wearing masks, that's totally fine. Like, there's no studies that say it's bad. Yeah, because no one's been dumb enough to do it. That's why we don't have the studies, right? It's not going to impede their ability to learn how to talk, even though they can't see the lips of their parents moving, all these kind of things. And yeah, it's kind of going to weaken their immune systems, and they're going to get hit by this and hit by that and all these different things. But adults are scared, and we like adults more, right? So that's, that's not what we do. Moses' parents set a good example. They say, no, kids first kids first. Parents are willing to die for children, especially fathers should be willing to die for their wives and children, not the other way around. So first and foremost, it would have been perfectly biblical, per, biblically permissible for Moses' parents to give their lives just to save Moses just because he's their kid. But it seems as though from John Gill's commentary and from the text itself that they had some kind of inclination that it was not an ordinary kid. Just being their kid would be enough. I want to make that abundantly clear. Because I don't want anybody thinking, well, I can't, I can't, I can't you know, do something that would be in the realm of shrewdness, Christian shrewdness, that would preserve my children unless I've got a feeling that my child's going to grow up and deliver an entire nation out of Egypt. No, that's not the standard. That's not, that's not the standard. The standard is just, is this your kid? That's, that's enough. Because God has commanded you to provide for the welfare of your children, their physical welfare, their physical preservation, their very lives. But in the case of Moses, it seems as though the parents were saying, this is our kid, and that's enough, but also this is a special kid. So the word beautiful there is likely kind of hinting at that there's, there was something about Moses, his demeanor, his appearance, but something that indicated to them, this kid's going to be something. This kid's going to do something. This kid has been chosen for some kind of unique purpose by God. And it's very likely that they knew some of the prophecies 
of old, and were aware that they were coming up on the timeline that God had spoken of where Israel would be delivered from bondage. Israel is going to be delivered very soon, any day now. Could be just a few years. And at this time, when God has promised deliverance, a boy has been born, our boy has been born, and there's something about him. Can't quite place it, can't quite describe it, but what if he is going to be the one to deliver us? So, that's verse 23 of the text. And that's probably enough. <laughs> so we will, uh, we will spend three weeks, turns out, um, <laughs> instead of two. Um, but yeah, the lie of necessity is, is quite, it's quite a task. And I, I don't even feel like I did it justice, but we're, we're going to have to move on from that. So Lord willing, next Sunday, uh, we'll pick back up with verse 24, 25, and 26. Basically, though, what, what we're going to see in this is um, we're going to, Look at the idea of this is really where the gospel meat of the text comes in, where Moses, you know, he chooses to reject his identity as royalty in Egypt in order to identify with the people of God. And in that, I think there's also, you know, uh, verse 24, there's a good argument for uh, binding ourselves formally with the people of God in church membership. And so we'll probably spend a week on that, uh, what it is to forego the esteem of man. We'll get back into what I talked about earlier with the fear of man. Um, and driving out that lesser fear with a greater fear of God. And then we'll probably spend a whole week, two weeks from now, Lord willing, um, on verse 27. Let me just read it just to whet your appetites. It says, By faith Moses left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, Moses, after killing the Egyptian, uh, he did fear for his life the next day which is why he ran to Egypt. So it's, it's difficult. So I we'll have to, you know, theologically reconcile those by going back to the original source in Exodus where, you know, there's an Egyptian slave driver who is um, mistreating one of the Israelites. Moses steps in and actually kills the Egyptian. And then the next day he sees two of his Israelite brothers that are fighting against one another. And he tells them, why are you doing this? You guys are on the same team. And they say, who made you judge over us? Are you going to kill us as you did the Egyptian, and then he's like, oh no, people saw, and he runs, right, and he runs away um, because he was afraid, and the text literally says in Exodus he was afraid, but Hebrews chapter 11 verse 27 says he did not fear the king's edict, and so reconciling those, but the point is, and they can be reconciled, God's word doesn't contradict itself, but the point is that uh, I want to spend a whole week on verse 27 because really what it shows is the, the doctrine of fleeing in faith, which is another really important doctrine. So the lie of necessity, I spent so long on that. Why? Well, the lie of necessity, Christian shrewdness, becomes more relevant in times of tyranny. So does fleeing. So does fleeing. And I think that there's a strong doctrine from verse 27 of our text and multiple other passages of Scripture where uh, Christians... Um, it is permissible to flee, and in some cases, even command it to flee. That to stay would be sin. To stay would be sin. There are times where running is sin and cowardice. There are times where running is permissible. And there are times when running, fleeing, is commanded. And it's not, notice the text, verse 27, it doesn't say Moses flees in fear. It says Moses flees in faith. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king. So a doctrine of fleeing in faith, um, which I could spend multiple weeks on, uh, but we'll try to spend just one. Okay, so that'll be it for today. Uh, let's pray real quick. Father God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would bless it to your people and that you alone would receive all the glory. We pray this with confidence, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.